One of the things that SEER has um, determined in its research is that one in five First Nations have a drinking water advisory. But when we actually look at the number of reserves, it's actually one in three. I think it's something that we should all be ashamed of. Most of us have access to all of what we'd call the modern conveniences, and yet we have a whole section of our, of our society, a whole group of people that do not have access to even just what is considered a basic necessity of life. So who's Tom? Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. It's so good to see this you. This is Chief Finally. Irwin Redskow. Hello. Hi. Redskow. Very uh, nice to meet you. Hi. This is Councillor uh, Vernon Redskow. Oh, hello. Hi. Hi. Well, you guys have a boil water advisory, right? We've had one here for uh, 18 years. And we supply the water to Winnipeg. So it's quite, uh, quite ironic, it's I guess. It's hard to believe, really. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one of our... Uh, typical pump houses here. The water comes from the lake and then it goes through the, uh, there's a meter here and under the chlorine injector. So if you have a, you have a boil water advisory, so what is this water, what is this for then? It's just for domestic use, just for your, uh, your washing and uh, your laundry and uh, oh, so your you bathing have to and showering. And that. Treat the water there. even for that. Yeah, so we have bottled water, we have bottled uh, water delivery here, and one gallon or the five gallon jug. How long has that been? 18 years. So for some of the kids, they wouldn't have known anything different? No, that would have been all their life. Sometimes when they change the, when they change the uh, the chlorine on there, and they can smell it too. It's really strong. Eh? Really? So we use this. You can't drink this at all, then. No, unless you boil it. Eh? These are the jugs they they deliver. Eh? So they deliver it to your house for you? Yeah, every every house. And they sometimes they get pretty heavy to, to lift up. Eh? You have a good back for this job. <laughs> so do you, do you worry about the state of Shoal Lake at all? Yeah, we got lots of water and can't use it. That's a shame because when I was a kid, we could drink water anywhere. The biggest water issue facing First Nations right now is their ability to control and protect the source of their drinking water. What we do as our organization is we go upstream. We say to ourselves, so how did that problem get created? We've suffered a lot in the past because there's a, lot, there's a lack of consultation. Uh, and one of the issues is water. What I understand from the elders is that they said that Shoal Lake was a lake all by itself at one time and it had a natural source, it was a natural spring, so it, it was always clear. We have Lake of the Woods water coming into Shoal Lake. That's been blasted. I think that process was authorized by the International Joint Commission way back in the day and that they were, there was no consultation at that time. I think uh, over the years there's been a lot of population growth in terms of cottagers within a couple of kilometers of the community. Their sewage is uh, kind of more or less dripping down through a Falcon Creek into, into our lake. Lake of the Woods is all polluted so it's coming to Show Lake and it goes right by here, right through here into the intake. One of the things that Sears trying to do is creating a First Nations watershed planning model. We're really trying to get First Nations at the table in how water decisions are made by governments. It's still good to get in the game anyway and have a voice, you know, have, uh, have some say and uh, trying to uh, control the damage that's been done. We're also trying to look at it from a watershed level. And so we're trying to say we need to look really broadly at water and have everybody who might be impacted or who might create a problem sitting at the table making, having a voice making the decision. And we see First Nations as being critical to that. All the water within a certain area all flows into one general direction. That's basically the definition of a watershed. So our method of, of learning from First Nations is to do a case study analysis, essentially. What's an acceptable level of water quality and how do they make that determination? What are the things they're taking into account? Is it just human use or is it the use of other species?
When Sierra approached us to uh, examine how we develop uh, watershed management, we first asked them, well, what kind of water are you talking about? UINR is involved in both uh, sort of a drinking watershed management and also for the protection of aquatic species. And uh, we sort of saw them as two distinct things, but um, really they are related because what you do for watershed planning applies to all sources, whether it's drinking water or whether it's for the protection of aquatic species. I've always been interested in biology in particular, and I really enjoyed um, playing in the brooks and the lakes and the ocean and discovering what I could find. Oh, you have some cool things. Cool. So this is a, a I believe is a grubby. What do you call it in Mi'kmaq? But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little one. I used to do this as a child, eh? Play with fish. <laughs> The work that Shelley Denny is doing with the Unimaki Institute of Natural Resources is an example of both using traditional knowledge and her scientific training. That's the really important thing that we're learning from them, is how they, they actually combine these knowledge systems uh, to create solutions to protect this habitat, which is water. Dissolved oxygen, 9.9, .9, and the salinity is 17.44. I really wanted to do something that made a difference in the world. Um, it's, it's not just about research to me, it's about action and helping your people. And at the time I was the only Mi'kmaq student enrolled in a, in a science at my university and I believe probably in Atlantic Canada. It's a case study and it, it's a demonstration of the interconnectedness and how their research activities and their ultimate solutions are, are demonstrating that. We believe that that the long-term sustainability of a community has to start from the First Nation defining its vision for the future. A hundred years from now, what do they want their First Nation to look like? What would be the world they're trying to create? Our community is dying. Our people are dying because of the water. Finally, people are starting to get aware of our message that us as being custodians, as caretakers of the land, they should have listened to us a long time ago. Now they're starting to look at our methods, our teachings, our ways. We always think about um, the next generation. We always think about what we're doing today affects what happens tomorrow. Especially the elders, they always talk about whatever you do today um, impacts your grandchildren. The land and uh, everything is very, um, very resilient. The only the only negative impact is, is, uh, is man or humans, humankind, and what they do to it. Our belief is that uh, Mother Earth is a living thing, and uh, everything is connected.